welcome everybody, good morning colleagues and welcome to the Liverpool City Region Overview and Scrutiny Committee. There are a few housekeeping announcements I need to make before we get into the agenda. Uh, first of all, mobile phones, can we please have these all turned to silent? <clears throat> microphones, can I remind members and presenters to use microphones when presenting please? <laughs> it's a new system that's been installed, they're quite sensitive so you don't need to pull them close to your mouth to speak to be heard. Fire safety announcement, there is not a fire alarm test today. You have heard that right, it's been arranged and they don't go off in the middle of our meetings anymore so I'd like to thank uh, officers for arranging that. Um, if, however, the fire alarm does sound, can we please leave the building immediately via the side and exit and make your way out of the building as quickly as possible. The assembly point will be outside the Liverpool Museum, on the concourse, outside Brasco Coffee Shop. Finally, filming and photography this meeting will be filmed by the combined authority for live and or subsequent broadcast on the combined authority's website. The whole of the meeting will be filmed except where there are confidential or exempt items. Thank you. I have a couple of announcements. Um, the following councillors have been resigned and been replaced on the overview and scrutiny committee. And we should place on record our thanks to Councillor Gillian Flatley from Knowsley and Councillor Jared Kushner from Liverpool. And I'd like to welcome the following councillors who have been appointed to the LCR overview and scrutiny committee following approval by the LCR Combined Authority meeting held on Friday the 1st of November 2019. Mayor Councillor John Morgan from Knowsley and Councillor Sam Cross from Liverpool. Welcome. And finally, just a, a little additional announcement that I've added. Um, again, we are in Corret. Um, I think that's the second time running that we haven't had the, the right number of people in the meeting, which is a bit of a problem where you know, a lot of effort goes into these meetings and we keep finding ourselves not able to make decisions in a core manner, so I've asked officers to produce a report for me that will look at uh, potential measures to improve the situation, also looking at best practice in other authorities to see if they've been able to find a way to improve the situation. I understand this is being run by Steve and, and you, you agree with the idea, so hopefully for our next meeting we'll have that report to look at and see if there's anything we can do to improve the situation. Um, are there any apologies for absence? Yes, sir. we've had apologies from Councillor Kevin Wainwright, Councillor Adrian Jones, Councillor Trisha O'Brien, Councillor Jean Stapleton and Councillor Soron Watson. And are there any further apologies? Okay, if there are no further apologies, can we, we note those apologies please? And the next item is the declarations of interest. Have any declarations of interest been received? If there are no declarations of interest, can we move on to the next item of the agenda, which is the previous <coughs> minutes of the LCR Overview and Scrutiny Committee, held on the 4th of September 2019. The minutes of the meeting of the LCR Overview and Scrutiny Committee from the 4th of September, they're included from page 1 to 12. Has everybody had an opportunity to look at those minutes? And are the minutes now agreed and accepted as an accurate and record accurate record of the meeting. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, on the basis that we are in chorus, it's very difficult to show appreciate and members will, will, will be aware of this, that we're, we're not really able to formally sign off things. So we will sign off and give an indication that that's the view of the committee. But it, as you'll see with the last set of minutes, we've had to record everything that it was in the core of committee. Um, and if members are agreeable, that's the approach we'll adopt again on this occasion. Um, but so it's just to remind members that we're not formally sort of in the, the sort of process that we would if we were corporate. Is that helpful and clear? Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Jill. Um, so the, well, I, I won't sign those minutes because I need to have a call thing to do that. So moving on to the next item of the agenda, which is Metro Mayor Steve Rotherham's update. Can I invite Metro Mayor Steve Rotherham to take us through his update and his recent activity, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, before we do, can I just uh, say that Charles Yankai's last uh, meeting 
Um, so um, I think on behalf of everybody, I think we'd like to wish Charles all the very best in his new endeavours. Um, I've worked with him for a long time and um, he's an absolutely uh, professional to the, the core. Um, Chair, just to support what you said about the policy, it's a, it's a real issue for us and it does affect um, our final accounts as well and sometimes that can cause issues because if you get an unqualified account, it, that's clean about health. Sometimes if it's qualified by the fact that there's meetings that aren't quoted, people have time to ask questions. So it's just to stress uh, what you said that it really is, I uh, think, vital that we sort this out as soon as possible. Um, if I start then, Chair, with uh, the progress since last time in regard to the major rail dispute and uh, what's happened with the RMT, um, I, I obviously asked for both sides to, um, to sit round uh, with ACAS. Those talks resulted in two um, principal agreements earlier um, last year and, and this year. Um, but then they didn't um, pass the final hurdle. Fortunately, um, again, we got both sides with myself sitting around the table and we've now got an in principle agreement that has been put to, to members and will be put to local members uh, which will hopefully put an end to the three year dispute um, over the guard and the trade and as people will know um, since inheriting the dispute um, I've been proud to um, to work with both sides to come to um, this um, solution which guarantees a guard uh, a second safety critical person on every trade and I think we can now look forward to what we should we celebrate, which is the first publicly owned Roman stock in the whole country. We're the first, and I'm sure that where we lead others will follow. Um, but they will be the most accessible trains in the country. And it's part of what I'm trying to do in regards to a London style transport system. And I'm sure we'll come on to um, some more of that. Uh, in September, I uh, attended the Convention of the North. And that was in Yorkshire in Rotherham. Um, and ahead of the convention, myself and, and Andy Byrne made calls on the government around five priorities. And they were action to sort out the Northern Rail debacle, um, providing a London style subsidy for our buses, action on clean air, more support for people who are rough sleeping, and devolution of more powers for skills and training. And I reiterated those demands uh, in a face-to-face -face meeting with the Prime Minister and we've now produced a Northern Manifesto and that's going to be, I believe, uh, published tomorrow. So um, that will, I think, highlight some of those issues which is cross-board party here, just to let you know. Um, early this month, I announced the start of a new era for smart ticketing and smart travel across the city region with our metro cars which replaces or will replace the walls and uh, it's really important because it's the first step in delivering a much more simplified transport system to we'll cap fares at a daily rate for instance similar to what passengers have enjoyed in London for years and um, it will eventually um, end up with a contactless tap in tap out system that London's got and um, London has had for, for some time. Also, uh, recently we announced the creation of a £5 million social innovation fund to support socially trading organisations to multiply and grow those uh, businesses across the city region. And I want us to be the, the fairest and most inclusive local economy. Um, and our social enterprises are at the heart of what we're trying to uh, achieve. And I'm confident that this fund will all you know, will drive new innovations but also help our um, thriving third sector in the city region and help that to go from strength to strength. Um, we've developed further since last time our local industrial strategy um, and I've been hosting a number of consultation events. I've had them with trade unions, I've had with chambers of commerce, with the third sector, uh, the social economy, all sorts of different groups and we're looking forward to that continued engagement until uh, early next year when we have to submit that to government for sign off. But that will set the strategic direction for the Liverpool City region for maybe a decade, maybe two in the future. Um, I, 
was somewhat encouraged uh, to hear Grand Shap saying that Northern Rail can't continue uh, the way things are. It provides a really poor service to passengers. There will be um, members here who represent uh, the likes of, of Halton or um, Southport or Rosie <coughs> who rely on uh, Northern services uh, and basically it's travel chaos. You don't know when you're turning up at the station whether the train will be on time whether it will actually uh, turn up at all, or if it does, whether it will be sure for whether it can get on and off the train. So um, we've said that Northern is not fit to run the trains and the franchise uh, in the north. And um, I emphasised the point when I met um, the Secretary of State that there needs to be um, the franchise removed, the public ownership, uh, it's called. Uh, an operator of last resort brought in and um, I think uh, I've met Northern since and they promised further improvements um, which I don't think have been forthcoming and therefore unless there is a dramatic turnaround I still think an operator of last resort needs to be uh, brought in for Northern and that will send a clear signal that we might accept the poor standard of trade and services uh, in the local city region across the country. Uh, I, I just want to give a, a House of Faith update to know because uh, that was um, muted last time. Um, obviously, it's nearly a decade of austerity which has led, led to uh, an exponential rise in homelessness and rough sleep, and we've seen that, of course, across the whole city region. And we're piloting a housing first approach, uh, and it's uh, one of these uh, approaches that the government give us some pilot money for and if it's successful can we go about further across the country. But we're making good strides and we've welcomed uh, a number of our first service users uh, into homes of their own, so not houses, not hostels, but into their own homes with their own furniture and then we'll provide the wraparound support. Um, and I, I just want to put on record of the county chair um, our thanks to the Housing First team and to Kate Farrell and I'm not sure um, that you'll be hearing more from Kate, I think, later the, uh, in, in this meeting. Um, as you'll know, um, we're also working on active travelling, a 600 kilometre walking and cycling network, which will span the length and breadth of the city region. Um, hopefully that will result in more people ditching the car, providing a genuine quality alternative so that people can use public transport. And, um, friendly and more environmentally friendly modes of transport. Um, I was pleased to announce recently the appointment of Simon O'Brien, and people will know him from his uh, days as an actor, but he's also a, a keen cyclist, well, I'd say a fanatic cyclist, uh, but he took us out on a, a bike ride um, a couple of Fridays ago, and I'm pleased to note that Simon stayed on his bike, uh, some of us uh, didn't. Um, but I want to wish Sam all the very best in, in his endeavours because I think this could really be something where the game that we steal a lead in the city region. And finally on Friday, uh, there was a meeting of find authority and uh, we approved our new housing strategy. And um, you'll see in the press hopefully that we're calling on the national government to provide us with uh, £200 million pounds and that will be for brownfield remediation. In other words, taking those contaminated sites that have stood idle for years, sometimes decades, in parts of our city region, clearing them, getting them up to a standard whereby they can be commercially developed, and then we'll see houses being built on those. That will take the pressure, of course, on rebuild. Um, but we think we can uh, unlock the potential for 42,000 homes if the government is to do this uh, across the six um, provide authority areas and also it would uh, dovetail very nicely with our brownfield register which is the first in the country which identifies 700 sites that we can develop so if we get the money we can do that we'll see more houses built on brownfield see less development on green space and green field uh, i think everyone's doing it so with that chair i'm calling to answer any questions that members may have. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, do members have any questions? Come to the mic. 
not sure. Okay. Well, let's see. And there's just a question about that operator of last resort that you mentioned. Is this similar to what happened on the, the Eastern Line when it basically went back to civil service control and started? Stagecoach gave the keys back because they couldn't make any profits on the line. Went back into civil service control, the government control, and ended up returning 200 million back to the Treasury. Is that a similar thing that you're asking for for the Northern Line? Thanks. It, it, it's very similar. Uh, and you're right, it was uh, the East Coast, wasn't it? The main line. Uh, they went back into public ownership and turned around the profit. And that profit then was plowed back into the general fund that it could have gone into. Um, providing more fares for those passengers, it could have been more regular services. That's the beauty of renationalising our rail service, isn't it? That's where we need to get to. Um, we've got an opportunity here in the, in the city region and we've gone to our enclosed network, which we're pursuing, because we'd like to do that. And uh, we're in detailed negotiations with uh, DFT. But on the northern service, it's just that it's not really improving to any significant standard where you can guarantee that you turn up and the trains there and that's all our passengers want they just want to know if they're not going to use the car which is what we all want because of the climate emergency that if they're going to use public transport that's going to turn up for them and unfortunately northern's not being able to guarantee that and that's why i think that the operator of the last resort the uh, public ownership model is probably the best thing that we can do but who knows it's going to be a general election and let's see what comes after that because it could be far more than northern that facing uh, public ownership. Councillor Key, then Councillor Ghost. Mm -hmm. Just following on from that, um, I think everybody's delighted to see the back of northern, but part of northern's excuses has always been the fact that uh, they feel they can't do quite what they were scheduled to do because of delays in electrification, infrastructure, investment, rolling stock, stuff like that. And so you have things like the Pacers, which have been decommissioned about 20 times, is still running. Um, it seems to me that an uh, operator of last resort may face similar challenges. I'm not quite certain where we are with these challenges. It would be helpful, and maybe not now, but maybe with Councillor Robertson, perhaps, to give us a briefing on where we are with this investment program, because that's obviously conditions what any operator can or cannot do, apropos rolling stock and reliability. Um, yeah, John, uh, in regards to infrastructure, you're absolutely right. Um, both the coalition and the current government have invested in the things that they promised they would invest in, and we need to hold them to account on that. In, in regard to uh, Network Rail, <coughs> Network Rail have failed on a number of major strategic projects to ensure that they were delivered not just on time but delivered at all. And that's caused the likes of uh, Northern and TPE um, some problems. And we've had similar sort of problems uh, in ensuring that some of our projects on the Mersey Rail Network have been delivered not just on time, but to the estimated cost that we were originally given. And sometimes it's many multiples of that estimation that we've had to try and um, find the, the funding for. I, I think the problem in all this is that the, the um, franchisees agree to a timetable and it's the timetable that I think that needs to be looked at and needs to be refreshed. I think Northern will do that anyway, um, but if people could just have the guarantee that the services, even if it was a um, reduced service, but that the services would turn up, that's how you get modal shift and that's the problem at the moment. Hi Steve, you said there's potential for 42,000 new, uh, new homes. Um, are these going to be social housing or council homes or luxury private homes? That, that's up to you as councillors and the, the individual local authorities because all we can do is get pots of money. What basically our job is to go down and argue on behalf of the six local authority areas that we've got things that are investment opportunities for UK PLC and they don't try and get our fair share because as you know we've been hit the hardest in the whole country. Uh, Six local authority areas had some of the biggest cuts in the whole country. And so if we get the opportunity to go down and put forward a, a, a case where there are potentially pots of money that we can access, all we do basically is come back as the combined authority and have that then as a central resource that individual local authorities can get into. 
So for me, I think it should be not just social housing, I think council housing um, has uh, its day is, is, is back for me. I think um, you know, there were times when it was much more difficult, but I think the, the general public now, certainly people who've grown up in council housing and council housing states, they will understand um, that we might be owned by the council, but they were managing my house out, wasn't it? Um, and I think the it's time has come again. And in regard to um, social rents, I think that, that's the other thing that we should be doing. We should be building more affordable homes. And when I say affordable homes, I'm talking about not affordable rents, I'm talking about housing that's more affordable. I think we should be doing that. And there's a different way in which we can make the mix right. Look, uh, uh, we, do we need to build more top end housing? Of course we do. That shouldn't be the only thing that we do. We should very much cater for those people who at the moment attracted the BRS, the uh, private rented sector, we were paying ridiculous rents. Sometimes the government is subsidising them through the housing benefit. I go straight to rip off landlords and all that. So we need to look at housing at a strategic level, which is what we're doing here. And that may, may well be um, plans to look at um, landlord licensing and all sorts of stuff. But we've got a big picture for what we want to do on housing. And as I say, on Friday, it's reduced to the demand of those. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, Steve, I know um, homelessness is a big thing for you, and I know you've had dedicated to that. On a personal thing, I'm dealing with, with family, I'm dealing with three families now. And uh, people are under the perception that homelessness is sleeping in the street, but there's so much homelessness that I'm not on the street. And I worry about that, that we're maybe, maybe the councils and the city region. Are we doing enough to help these people? And I, I, it's only just come to light to me, as I say, we've just now been involved with the family who's had to move in a club in hotels. And at the cost of that on its own, well, I, I just wanted to make aware of that, because I didn't realise how much journalists there is that, that are not actually sleeping on, on the streets. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, hidden homelessness is gold, and, and, and that is part of what we want to tackle. But of course, the most obvious manifestation of homelessness is rough sleeping, seeing people on our streets, seeing people in weather like this, and last night will be freezing cold uh, in all sorts of inclement weather. We have to tackle that first. But you're right, that's why we need to build more houses, we need to build more homes, we, we need to build more places. Um, and the difficulty is, isn't it, that politics on many occasions comes to play because as soon as there's a scheme announced then there are opposition or there will be opposition to that. It seems that everybody agrees that we need to build more houses but not anywhere near them. So we, we need to do something about unlocking that and that's why I think the brownfield approach is probably the best way to do this. We get more homes on ground for things like that are derelict and they'll be left um, you know, in, a, in a vein for many, many years we can do all that. But at the other end, whilst we're doing that, we can't wait till we've got the right amount of supply and demand in the housing sector and then all of a sudden people will be rough, sleep, sleeping rough on our streets. We need to do something about those. That's why housing first. And ours is a high fidelity model. Ours is the closest you'll come to the Finnish model. The, from Finland, not the Finnish, uh, from, from Finland, uh, where it, it originated. And ours is, I think, something that other areas in the country will very quickly pick up uh, once we've proven that it works and already starting to see the results, the positive results of getting people on the streets. But you're right, it's so for safe and it's gold and all that sort of stuff. We need to uh, also tackle that. Councillor Marshall. Thanks. Uh, very welcome the Brownfield initiatives. Um, you'll know the has market renewal initiatives that were on fire of the Quangos back in 2010 the coalition have left us with a lot of derelict areas that were already primed um, for renewal um, so, and I don't know the detail, I'm sure we'll get it in the next section um, for the 700 sites I'm assuming that that brand will register already includes all of them HMRI sites across, I say, you know, setting the world ones um, that were just ready to go with the funding and then it was 
does include them and, and sell it. So my first um, job as a member of parliament was to go meet Grant Shapps when he announced HMRI was being scrapped. And um, he, he assured me um, that the new home bonus would be you know, an ideal replacement and that you know, the market would be able to, um, to step in and all that. But there's still huge swathes of those areas that were cleared um, for housing renewal that haven't been developed. And they're the ones really that I think that we need that help just to get them to a level where somebody else will come in. But I also think that part of that mix has to be about enabling councils to build council houses again. And then you start to get that the synergies of all of that working together rather than what we've got at the moment which is you know councils are desperate for housing but haven't got any money they can't remediate brownfields because it's too expensive developers won't step in you know there's an obvious failure failure in the market and that's what i think that as you said you know we put all that together uh, the brownfield first approach will be great for the whole city A couple of quick questions from the chair, if I may. Um, just following up on Councillor Marshall's question, um, I obviously also welcome this focus on brownfield sites and, um, and, and aim to build houses on them wherever possible. Is it possible for you as Metro Mayor to say that we don't need to build on any greenfield sites or, or, or any of the uh, green spaces at all and we can commit to just building on brownfield sites? That's my first question. My second one was, um, you mentioned active travel in your presentation. One aspect of that is 600 kilometres of improved cycle lanes, which I would massively welcome. I really think cycling really needs more attention to, to change the transport mix in the city region. However, only 4.8 million of the £172 million pounds of transforming cities monies has been allocated to cycling as yet. That's not enough to create 600 kilometres. So is more of that transforming city money going to be committed? Is it going to happen soon? And are the right resources going to be put in place to quickly draw up a plan to get that money spell, spent on, on cycle lanes? So let's do the cycle lanes first, now we go on to, to, to the brownfield. But on cycling, cycling lanes, um, if we had £100 million tomorrow, we couldn't spend that within the timescales that the government would want us to spend it within. So it's normally at, at, at the least um, period around sort of two or possibly four years that you have to spend in, in government site. Government site. Um, the issue will be that you still have to get planning permission to do a lot of the enabling works on segregated cycle lanes, and that's what people want. They don't want paint on tarmac, they want segregated cycle lanes. So we have to go through that process, which is what we're doing now. So the money that we've allocated, the £60 million, pounds, we know we'll spend that within the time scale. That's by no means our, the height of our ambitions. That's not even the first down payment. That's just an indication of what we're going to do. And we will, within the next decade, build the 600 kilometre walking and cycling network. But I'm much more ambitious than that. And um, we'll have to see, Chair, what comes out uh, in my manifesto um, after the general election's over um, because you'll see that we have um, far more ambitious plans about how we can achieve that. But it's all to do with two things, isn't it? It's having the money, but it's having the strategy so that you can deliver on the plans and that's what we're doing. We are developing a strategy so that, in, in, in all honesty, whoever was the better on there at the moment, we've put this course of action where we're out looking at networks and how we interconnect all those things up to make certain that it's the most affordable and the most value for money, but also it does what it should be doing, which is not just a hundred yards of red tarmac with a line on it, it is actually building cycling routes. So that's why we've chosen the first few, but you'll see that um, our plans go um, much further than that. On Brownfield, um, again, um, that might be something that people in manifestos want to, to commit to uh, Brownfield first. As the command authority, we aren't the planning authority, so we can't do that at the 
development, uh, we do get some spatial development powers um, by March, April next year. Um, potentially, we have to do uh, a spatial development strategy. And it might be that the general course of direction is that we're trying to persuade our partners and the local authorities that we build on Brownfield. But it's not something constitutionally that we can force local authorities. They are the deliverers, they are the planning authorities. They are the people that hopefully, if we get the money, we can persuade that they can remediate land and then build on, on that land first. But um, no, it's not, not something that you can have a so any more of that. Can we note this update? Oh, sorry, are there any more questions? Any last questions at all? Oh, yes, Sam. Um, you mentioned that um, we've had the most successful trains now, but in my ward, we've currently got two train stations that are accessible. We've got two train stations that have got disabled parking and disabled toilets, but what's the point when a passenger can't get down to the platform? Um, yeah, we've got not just two, uh, there are many, unfortunately. It's part of the fact that we've got uh, an ageing infrastructure in the local city region, um, which is the, the Mersey uh, rail network currently. But we uh, I told you we've got plans to to do more and to take more control over it. That includes accessibility and I think last time I was here Chair, I, I made the commitment that we will not be happy until 100% of our network is accessible. At the moment, I think it's 62% and that is probably higher than anywhere else outside of London. But is it where we want to be now? So we've just announced uh, 15 million, 7.5 million of ours and 7.5 million uh, from government to do another six um, stations and then we'll build it in. But look, whatever anyone says, austerity still rules. We're, we're, you know, we haven't got the magic one. We're not the DUP. We can't go to the magic one tree and get a, you know, a billion quid whenever we want on it. So we have to work within our means. It's just the same as councils are being squeezed. Sometimes we feel it on transport. Not just that, you know, have a look at what we're having to, to deal with on buses. Um, have a look at what we're trying to do with trying to upgrade our ferries. Or we want to have a 21st century transport, public transport system that we're all proud of. And that's what we're trying to do, but it's going to be incremental. Only because uh, unless there's a, and I would say this is a political point, unless there's a party of my political persuasion, then no one's going to open the coffers to us. Um, so I want to ensure that we do get a Labour government and that Labour government work and hopefully with a, a Labour and Metro America future would really start to make huge inroads to tackle some of the issues that we've identified. Any more questions? In that case, uh, can we note the update from the Metro Mayor and thank him for his attendance, please. Next up is the Liverpool City Region Housing Statement Update. This report seeks to provide the committee with an update related to the draft City Region Housing Statement and Delivery Plan 2019-2024. Can I ask John McGee, Head of Government Relations, to take us through this report, please? Thank you, Chair, um, and hello, members. Um, good morning to you all. Um, so, the Metro Mayor in, in, in his trademark style has stolen some of my thunder. Uh, some of what I was going to say is, is not going to be news to you, but uh, nevertheless, I'll, I'll rehearse it anyway. So, the housing statement has been a long time in its gestation. You will recall, perhaps, that we brought a previous iteration of this piece of work to you in March 2019. Uh, quite a lot has happened since then, uh, coming up to the present day when the report and the statement was approved by the combined authority this this Monday, this Friday just gone, the first of November. In in short, um, we've moved away from a strategy and to something that we're calling a housing statement. The difference between those two things is detail essentially. What we have now is a is a high level set of principles which we can all agree on as a city region. So that's the combined authority, the six constituent local authorities our housing associations, private sector builders, and colleagues in Homes England. It's quite high level, but we think nevertheless it's, it's quite ambitious and a really strong statement of what we want the housing market to be in the city region. 
how we want to change it and how we want to use housing to help fix some of the broader social issues that we have here, including inclusivity, workplace poverty, fuel poverty and the low carbon economy. So it doesn't sit in isolation. The Mayor's focused closely this morning on, on Brownfield, which is, is absolutely key and at the heart of what, how we want to build out and deliver on our housing ambitions. But it's important to say that it's not just about where we put the houses, it's about what they do for the people here. So this has been a piece of work that we've developed in harness with all local authorities. They're, they've all signed up to it, they're, they're all co-authors. We feel like we're delivering on their ambitions as well. So it's, it's, a, it's from that perspective, a, a, a really good piece of work. So what's it gonna do is the question. Um, I hope that you've had a moment to read uh, the report this morning or uh, in preparation to this meeting, but it's going to tackle, uh, uh, to all intents and purposes, five, five key priorities, and I'll just touch on those all for a moment. So the first is to, to deliver more homes. It's going it's to be a Ron Seal statement. It's going to do what it says on the tin. We want more homes, but we want more better homes and in the places where people want to live. So it's all well and good saying that we're going to build some houses, but it's important that we put them in a place that people want to live and make sure that they're accessible. Um, back to Council of Gorse's point about the transport system, we want to make sure that housing is accessible too. We have a huge amount of housing in the city region that is, is no longer fit for purpose given, given our aging population, and that's something that we want to address in the medium term. The aging population in itself is a focus. Um, much like the transport system uh, is, is aging and needs investment, so does our housing infrastructure, particularly in, in, in pockets of the city region, which are characterised by that aging demographic. Um, this is a huge burden on our public services, from the NHS to local authorities, adult social care teams, uh, and it's something that we want to focus on uh, as a key priority for the city region and all of our local authority partners. Um, it's going to be a, a huge driver of, of, of change within the city region. Regeneration is really important. Uh, Councillor Marshall mentioned the cancellation of, of HMRI there from a brownfield perspective, but it's, it's worth noting that that had a huge impact on the state of the housing market in the city region. And to the point I made about um, ageing population, uh, it's worth recognising that some of our housing stock is not fit for purpose for anyone, let alone the ageing population. And that's something we need to address, both from a social perspective and from uh, a low carbon and greening our broader economy perspective too. That is not currently government policy. It's not fundable. But we're going to try and work as best as we can with the existing funders to try and work through that. We may be able to think about how we can fund it from, from local sources of funds in the, in the city region, in, within the combined authority. And we will, within our action plan, commit to make a business case to a government of whatever colour or persuasion is in place after December the 12th this year, that that's something that needs future investment. Improving the quality of renting is, is also important to us. The Mayor mentioned there that uh, we're one of the few city regions where landlord <coughs> licensing is in place, but it only covers a, a small portion of the city region. Um, that does improve the standard for, for many of the renters within the city region, but it, it doesn't do it for all of them. Uh, and we want to try and make sure that we can work with the private social rented sector to, to, to sort of raise the standard there. I would say uh, uh, from the perspectives of our colleagues who are, who are working on Housing First that they've been, and, and, and I'm sure that Rob can speak to this too from the Households into Work side, we've been like, staggered by the quality of some of the, the PRS that's on the market and recognise it's something we want to try and seek to fix and improve. Our levers as an organisation are, are quite distant, but nevertheless we want to think carefully and think innovatively to do things if there's anything that we can support. And lastly, um, homelessness uh, remains uh, a, a huge imperative challenge for us here in the city region and it would be remiss of us to put any strategic housing documentation out into the public domain without recognising the scale of the challenge, but also the fact that we are doing some relatively innovative things here in the city region to attempt to address it. Uh, I am going to speak more on Housing First. Unfortunately, Ken Farrell is unable to join us at short notice this morning uh, to tell you a little bit about that. The Mayor has, and, and Councillor Finner, and your observations about uh, that the hidden homelessness agenda are really important to us too. Um, so those are the, the five main priorities. Uh, if anyone has any questions on anything I've said, on any of the detail of the housing statement, then I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, John.
Um, are there any comments on that presentation? Councillor Finneran? Thanks, Chair. One of my questions is, which I keep getting asked about, where they say that they're going to build homes affordable homes. What do you mean by affordable homes? Because a, a, a lot of questions I get is that you call them affordable homes, but you can't afford them. Um, that was another thing. As you say, the older population, I know in my area that there's, a, there's an awful lot of people in three, four bedrooms, houses, that they don't want to go in flats. They, they just say no to flats. They want sort of bungalow type things. And I think if we concentrated on that, the amount of homes that we'd have for bigger families as well would really, really be successful. But all I keep getting told is that, well, they can't afford to build the bungalows. And that annoys me as being an older person. It really annoys me to think that you've put all that money in. The other thing I'd like to do away with is these housing associations, because they don't get the support what they were actually set up for. I believe they don't anyway. Thanks, Chair. I'm sorry for the rant on. Uh, no, no problem at all. Um, so those are all interesting points and they've all come up in the, the conversations that we've been having in the preparation of this. Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting hearing your perspectives from those two because they, 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 they chime quite closely with some of the feedback that we've had from Council of Organ as a <coughs> portfolio holder. So if, if you look at the statement itself and look at the, the, the foreword and, and, and the vision section, so the first four or five pages, um, particularly in Councillor Morgan and the Metro Mayor's foreword, there's, there's, there's a, an attempt to, to measure what we mean by affordability and, and absolutely that their message, and I think we, we take this to heart in terms of how we want to deliver on this, affordability means real affordability. It's not, you know, uh, some government set definition. If you look at the, 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 the definition of affordability in, in the statute, it, it's, it's half a million quid, right? And that's, that's laughable for our city region, that's not affordable. So we need to think about what, what does that mean for us? And I think it would be churlish to try and put a, a quantum on that. What do we mean in terms of pounds and pence? What we should be thinking is engaging with the people who need a home, want to live in the city region, and want to live in the place where they've grown up, and talk to them about what they feel is affordable, and then try to work with the market, whether it's housing associations, private providers, or, or other types of tenure, to deliver on that level of ambition. I've had quite a lot of conversations with colleagues in, in, in central government, in Homes England and in and the Ministry for Housing Communities and Local Government, there just isn't a recognition of the need for a different approach to housing and a housing market economy in a place like Liverpool than there is in the southeast of England. It's very much a blinkered approach. And let's be let's be clear, it's a common approach across the north of England. It doesn't matter when you whether you're in Kirby or you're in Morley, right? It's 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 a it's a similar issue. Um, on your, your second point about um, sort of churn of tenure is the way that I would describe it, about how do you incentivise old, old, older people to move into the type of home that they would choose to live in. And bungalows, again, is something that's come up in conversation. Very much part of our thinking of working with the local authorities about how, how, we, how we provide good quality, uh, manageable, accessible, and indeed supported accommodation for some of the older community and as you rightly say, a byproduct of that is that some of these larger executive, well-built homes that have been there for a long time could be available for families. That needs to be part of our planning over the next 10 to 15 years and very much will be. So when the mayor is talking about building new homes on, on Brownfield, and he said some of them will be affordable, some of them will be executive, our, our thinking and our planning is very much that quite a few of them will also be fulfilling that market because if people in the old...